I'm not going to teach you how to make other people think that you're more empathetic. I can teach you how to be more empathetic. And I'm not going to teach you how to make more money because what I'm going to teach you is how to be a better person, how to be a better leader, how to understand your emotions, how to use them to be more successful and help others. Hello, everyone. This is Kathy Caprino, and welcome to my podcast, Finding Brave. I've created this show for everyone who longs to create something bold and brave in their life, to rise up, speak up, and stand up for who they are, and to reach their highest and biggest visions. Each week, I'll be speaking with inspiring guests from all walks of business, leadership, entertainment, the creative arts, and the entrepreneurial world, and they'll be sharing their intimate stories of finding brave and offer their best strategies for building your most rewarding, joyful, and meaningful life, business, and career. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Finding Brave. It's sunny here. That's a very good start. My goodness, it's been gray. And this is coming to you in May. We are actually still in January, right? But um, so happy to have you and so thrilled to have our amazing guest today, Luis Moreno, who I have known for, it feels like decades, Luis, yes. but I, I looked it up. I think it was 2018 we met, yeah. but thank you for taking the time to be here on Finding Brave. So happy to have you. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Great to uh, see you. Kathy. Oh, so happy. All right, folks, we are talking about so many things. It's hard to title these, you know, when you know you're going to be hitting on 52 important topics, but this is once a great leader, not always a great leader, the need for expanding emotional intelligence and a few other things which you're going to talk about. Uh, and let me tell you, let me read Luis's bio, but I, I do want you to know how we first met, which, which really was inspiring. And then you went on to help my son, Elliot, who at the time was coming out of college. Yes. And, you know, he was new to LinkedIn. And I, truly, I will never forget that. We were not even dear friends. You know, we had just <laughs> met professionally and you said, oh, happy to help, help Elliot. And you know, when, when you're starting out and you're young and it's all new, that kind of mentorship is so impactful. He sends Absolutely. his best, Luis. Thank you for that. All right, let me tell you about Luis. Luis has over 18 years of experience in seven Fortune 500 companies. I wasn't quite aware of that. He leverages his expertise in human-centered leadership and emotional intelligence and collaborates with other experts around the world to help foster workplace cultures and communities that are healthier and happier. And I wanted to add for all, because you know you have such a, an important keen focus on diversity and equity and inclusion. And you're gonna tell us a little bit about why you have that focus now, Absolutely. but there you go. Let, let us start there, Luis, can we? Oh, I do wanna say, here's how we met. Um, I was writing about leadership and diversity, I think back then, 2018. And yes. tell us, tell everyone what happened there. Then you I reached actually, out. Actually, you know, through LinkedIn, I saw articles of yours and I read it and I was just fascinated. I really liked what you were talking about. And, and you know, I reached out. I, uh, there was one particular article that uh, I wrote to you about and I was actually impressed that you responded. And then, you know, that's how we connected and we got to see each other in person, which was uh, right. great. That's right. That's <laughs> right. That's right. And then you shared with me about the CEO then of uh, Synchrony Financial, where you worked, and you were in a senior marketing role then, weren't you, Luis? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I was working in, yeah. in marketing uh, there. And so, yeah. Just, That's it. And we connected, right. and then I interviewed the then uh, CEO for Forbes. So that's how we got to know each other. Now, can you tell us a little bit about the trajectory of – you know, a lot of people will ask me too, how, how, how did you go from kind of corporate marketing to what you do now? What was, can you just maybe even start before a little bit earlier, what you thought you wanted to do in your career, how it went, and then what was the catalyst for the work you do now in your own business? Yeah, no, thank you for the question. Actually, I am. Um, so, you know, when I, before working at a company, I was always fascinated to see kind of those, uh, you know, global corporation, major businesses, right? That were, uh, you know, fast growing Fortune 500. I always thought, wow, how interesting it would be to get to 
you know, be to become a, a, an employee in those companies. So when I went to uh, business school, I had the opportunity to, you know, interview with multiple of those companies. And then I started, you know, I received uh, one offer to work in one. And then while I was working on that one, another one uh, made me another offer. And then I went and I ended up working at seven Fortune 500 companies. So it was, uh, you know, kind of dream come true in the sense of being able to be exposed to great, you know, very talented, uh, high achievers, you know, very, um you know, just uh, folks that, that are really, you know, really smart because, you know, they they have the ambition, they go to top schools and then they end up working in these companies that are really competitive to to stay, right? So you really have to be right. on the top of your game to be in it. So I, I wanted to see that in person, that fast growth. But what I learned was that I was seeing a lot of great leadership, but I also saw great leadership that was not so great, or right? I saw leadership that was not so great. <laughs> And I was uh, fascinated to see kind of what were those great leaders that, um, you know, they, I saw like two kinds of leaders. They were great leaders or leaders that were admired from the top and liked, you know, from the top and also liked from the bottom. So, you know, the employees that worked for them were, you know, uh, always happy to work for them, would do anything for them, were very highly motivated and all that. And then there was a, uh, another kind of uh, leaders that were very liked at the top right and they kept moving up and getting promoted and getting all kinds of opportunities but they were not very liked at the bottom so those people that were working for them were continuously looking for opportunities to work somewhere else to move outside of their team to get it they would take another assignment even if it was you know in another division that was not as popular or anything like that but would so that they could be outside of a leadership of that person and so i thought that was an interesting disconnect the top mm really like those folks, but the bottom didn't. And then I, that's where my interest uh, started to investigate. Why is that the case? And then I, I learned a lot of things that I'll be sharing with you through our podcast today. <laughs> I, I just <laughs> sigh. Um, I, and there's so much I want to even ask you with that, but can I make something clear? Because I think you and I are very much on the same page about how we view what truly inspiring leadership is. But you and I are not the same human beings, so you have a different perspective. But I want to make one thing clear. When you say there are some people that were liked from the top down, but were not liked with people underneath them, mm -hmm. I want to make something clear. And I want your thoughts. I think like is an interesting word. I think what I see in being a career and leadership coach is, People were, will work for someone they respect, mm -hmm. someone they trust, mm -hmm. but not necessarily like all the time. In other words, people we want to emulate or we feel are empowering are sometimes not the most likable in a moment or mm -hmm. in a meeting. Would you agree? Like, is it like we're talking about or is it respect, inspiration? You want yeah, to learn well, from that. that that's a complex uh, topic and a complex question. So I agree with you that, you know, uh, you won't, you will not always li uh, like a great leader in every moment, but there are, there is uh, some new dynamics in that context. Uh, so, you know, not disagreeing, but one of the changes yeah. that we're seeing is that it was very common in the past uh, for some leaders to say, I don't care about being liked. I'm about being respected. As long as I get respected and, and I get people to do what they have to do, I can care less whether I'm liked or not. And people would clap. And wow, that's an amazing leader. But what we're seeing now in your research is that there is more connection, especially with the new generations coming into uh, the workplace between liking and respecting. And there, there are two, there are multiple layers, generational layer and also a cultural layer. So in right. some uh, countries and some regions of the world, like Latin America, it's very hard for someone to respect you if they don't like you, because yeah. there is a connection where liking means I see in you something that, you know, I aspire to be, I connect with your values, you know, I feel comfortable, I feel like psychologically safe around you I feel that you look out for me and so that's kind of more what like means rather than <clears throat> because sometimes I'll speak with senior leaders uh, kind of more from the past they'll tell me well I'm not going to let people do whatever they want so that they can like me and then when I interview uh, employees especially younger employees when they tell me about liking what they describe is I like a, a leader that is looking out for me that gives me a vision 
that um, you know give me the resources that I need mm -hmm. entering the so they're not talking about let me do whatever I want. They are talking about give me the guidance, give me the resources, give me the structure so that I can succeed. And then I like you if you do that. So it's kind of a, a this is a whole a thing we could talk five <laughs> hours about, but I just I don't want to belabor it, but I do want to say this. You know, my world is professional women. Yes. Typically, I'm not painting all women with the same brush or all men. Typically, women, even incredibly high level women who we think are successful, struggle with the fear they won't be liked. Yeah. And that does make them have boundaries that are not sufficient, makes them have a hard time saying hard things, makes them apologize more. They're about to say something difficult in a meeting and they apologize for it or weaken the message because they want to be liked. And I do think that men don't tend to experience, they don't even understand what that feels like. Yeah. So I, that's why I'm careful with, yeah. because women often live the world. I've had two young managers say to me, I just want to be, I want to be liked. Yeah. And, yeah, and they're new is. to managing and they haven't gotten over that yet, that we can't always be liked. That's just important for me to say. Of course, no, and absolutely. I mean, if you if your goal is to be liked, you're gonna make you know decisions that will you know won't uh, be right. the right decisions in some cases. Actually, that connects your analogy that I'm making in my head. There is that one of the questions that I get a lot is you know whether being empathetic is good or bad, right? And I always say, hey, it's like everything in life, you know, everything in moderation. So right. you know, being being wanting to be liked is not necessarily a bad thing. It's just more what is the you know how much do you need to be liked. Or or do you want to be liked? If being liked is your main objective, that's probably not going to be uh, good for you Love it. as a leader, right? So then it's the same with empathy. It's like, you know, if you're not empathetic at all, if you have zero empathy, you're not going to be a great leader because you simply don't care about the needs of others. Uh, and as you start being more empathetic, you're going to be a better leader up to the point of the optimal level of, uh, you know, uh, empathy. And then there is such thing as being too empathetic where, you know, if you're going to have a hard time making decision if you're spending too much time thinking about the needs of others if you have a need to always like feel other people you know then you're going to be you're going to be slow because it's going to take you forever to make a decision. <laughs> right you're going to agonize and you're going to yeah oh i love yeah, it so. i see it as a spectrum like anything you know as a therapist we see uh personality disorders in a spectrum narcissism you can have it on a one or a 10 or anywhere in between i love it balance is what we're looking for beautiful all right now there's one other thing I, I would love you to share with listeners. And then I want to talk about emotional intelligence, what, yes. what you're, what you live and breathe um, and human centered leadership. You once said to me, and I don't want to put words in your mouth that um, what you were looking at in terms of what companies said were the optimal leaders and they paraded them in front of you at a leadership meeting. What, what did you say to me? I don't want to put words in your mouth. Yeah, no, that, you know, I mean, there is a disconnect. Um, a lot of times when I do, you know, like research um, with employees and I ask them about, you know, source of dissatisfaction is that they see that there is a mismatch between what they hear their company saying. So where it's like an employee works at a company and they're reading their website or, you know, kind of uh, any any promotional material that, they, that they're seeing the company projecting out there. And they feel that what the company is saying doesn't match what they are experiencing. Like we believe in diversity. Exactly. Like we believe in diversity, for example. And so we support say, diversity. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, tell us, like, tell us, know, because this is part of great leadership today. Absolutely. Because, you know, companies say, you know, a lot of, you know, companies have a need right now, you know, almost like an obligation to say that they are inclusive and that they support diversity and they will do some. I mean, there are some tricks that companies will do. You know, you will hire, you know, maybe you have somebody that is uh, from a diverse community and you put it in a leadership role and then you go and then you promote that, you know, via social media. Look at this, you know, our chief diversity officer is, you know, a person of color or a woman, right? And then, uh, but then, you know, if you look in the past, that worked because people are like, okay, great. They have a person that is a, you know, woman of color and a chief diversity officer, that company is amazing, right? Check. But now uh, the new generation is scrutinizing those things. So for example, okay, that's the, if the person has achieved a uh, role, then that's the person report directly to the CEO. Okay, that's the person have other senior leaders reporting to them. 
Is the person's uh, compensation comparable to others? Is the person being invited, you know, to the same types of uh, uh, meeting? What is the budget that that person have? Can the person did the person uh, move up through the organization? Was hired as an outside, uh, you know, higher, higher, right? Uh, how long does the person stay? Can the person pass the three to five year mark? What are the changes that are happening in the organization as a result of that participation? And so you're right, when you start looking at those things, you see that it's not really that, uh, you know, in some cases, not always, but in some cases, it was more like we have to do this move here, uh, but it's really, you don't see the impact, right? And, and what we're seeing is that the tenure of chief diversity officer, for example, in companies is kind of like the, between, you know, three to five years is, is the maximum you'll see. A chief you mean they'll officer. put a person in at, to check off a box? So it happens. And then that person the case, leaves because they're not getting the impact, the the influence, the authority, the budget that they need to make a difference. Right. Can I can I amplify that? I'm hearing doing a lot of speaking, hearing from companies we all know, media companies we know, and they have may have ERGs, employee resource groups for women. Yeah. And then they say they have no budget. Yes. And exactly. and it's run by volunteers, no money, nobody dedicated to it. So I want to say to you, people listening, if that's what you have, you're just checking a box and you're failing. There was. A, what do you think of that? There was, there was a story that uh, a good friend of mine told me the other day that kind of connects what you were saying. Uh, she was working at this uh, large, you know, uh, company and uh, they invited the women to go to this like leadership, you know, conference. Uh, and they were there, you know, maybe, I don't know, for a few days and they were all super fire up and, and pumped and excited and super encouraged. And they were talking about, you know, their future as, uh, you know, leaders, uh, how far they were, you know, how the company was basically doing all the things for them to succeed. And so they come back from this thing and they're like, you know, in the clouds, right? Like all super uh -huh. excited about their future and everything. They all, you know, kind of see you know, for where, where have you been? And it's like, yeah, I was like at that conference. And and he's like, what? What conference? <laughs> where? Where is that? Like, what? Where are you? So it's like the story here is like, okay, yeah, you told us all those things, and we believe it, and we got excited. But you, you know, how we're gonna be successful if you are not telling the rest of the company what the strategy is, what we're trying to do here? So then, what you are telling me, you're only telling me you're not uh, right. You have to go now to the to the male leaders and tell them, hey, our plan is for female leaders to come in and also succeed. So you know, she realized, well, this is not a a message for everyone this was only a message for us right how we disheartening to oh there's so much to unpack there all right thank you for sharing that <laughs> now let's talk about emotional intelligence if if you could what is it what do people not understand about it give us the primer that you teach when let's say i'm the leader sitting in your workshop or i'm working one on one with you and how do we know we have a problem with emotional or lack of emotional intelligence? Start from Absolutely. the beginning. What do we need to know? Yeah, yeah. No, so from the very basic, you know, what is emotional intelligence? And is that capacity that we have to really be aware of our emotions and, you know, understanding ourselves from a self-awareness standpoint and then be able to manage our emotions and understand the emotions of others, you know, to have the ability to motivate ourselves and then to leverage empathy to have more successful interpersonal uh, relationships. So this is important. I'm very excited because, you know, over the past, um, you know, 20, 30 years, uh, obviously there are, uh, the, you know, the parents of emotional intelligence that came out with this many decades ago had a hard time convincing people that the emotions were that important. But I think now more and more people are realizing that, you know, the, the, the power of emotions and how emotions can help you and how they can actually, you know, work against you if you don't know, if you don't understand your emotions and how to manage them. So uh, the good thing is that even when I started, I started with this work, you know, a number of years ago, and I had to, you know, email people, knock on doors, call, and, and I wasn't getting a lot of uh, traction. I actually got, um, I started writing, you know, uh, inspired by other authors uh, like yourself and started writing and people would comment on my and say, oh yeah, whatever. That's easy to say to your students in a classroom, but wait until you come to work for a company. It's like, no, I, at that time I wasn't teaching, but I said like, I'm not a professor at a university. I'm actually, a, I'm an actual employee. 
at a company, but the, the thinking was that that was something like esoteric, that was something like a lot of theory, but that it couldn't work in practice. It was one of the kind of, uh, I got that feedback. And the other feedback that I got was a lot about, uh, you know, people would, would go read my articles and go to a training and then come and, you know, more senior leaders, right? And they'd say, Luis, I have an idea, great idea for you. You, I like your training. That was very good. But you need to modify it and make it about how to make more money, how to bring more ROI. And people would say, like, for example, you you know, teach me how to make others think that I am more empathetic. And it's like, I'm not oh going to teach you how to make other people think that you're more empathetic. I can teach you how to be more empathetic and i'm not going to teach you how to make more money because what i'm going to teach you is how to be you know a better person how to be a, a better leader how to you know understand your emotions how to use them to be more successful and, and help others but um the, what i'm going to teach you is going to help you make better decisions and some of those better decisions that you're going to be making could actually end up generating less money because some of the decisions that you're going to make that are the best decisions, you know, from an ethics standpoint and from a community standpoint and from a holistic standpoint may result in less money in the short time, which, you know, it's going to mean more money in the long term because some of the short term decisions that make a lot of money now will cost you a lot in the future. So yeah. it's having that balance. Remember, you, you brought it up balance. <laughs> Let me ask why it's reminding me of of a dear colleague, Sean Aker, who's a top happiness expert. And people were like, happiness, good, great. But how does it impact my business? Well, his company um, did studies and proved that when employees took the steps that he's, you know, a positive psychologist, Harvard, um, when they took those steps, it improved the bottom line. He, you know, we always hear what is the business case? That's what business people want. What's the business case for this? But let me just ask this. If someone said to you, how do you teach it? How, how can I make people think I'm emotionally intelligent? Are they making the leap that they can't be, that they don't want to learn how, or they can't learn how? Is that, yeah, is that yeah. where they're coming from? Yeah. So one of the, uh, what I'm hearing a lot is like uh, leaders that are leading younger, you know, just the, the new generation of folks, you know, coming into the, into the workplace, they want something different from their leaders. So one of the things they want is a uh, connection, more of a personal connection. And part of that dimension in personal connection is sharing because they are, they were born, you know, with the internet and people's social media. So folks are more, the younger folks are more open to sharing and they tend to share things that were very personal that in the past, nobody would ever consider sharing because there makes them more, more vulnerable. For example, mental health. I have employees that have shared with me, you know, about their own uh, mental health uh, journey. And I'd never had an employee before, you know, in, in the past 20 years that was share something like that uh, with me, right? It would be considered, you know, you're, you're kind of derailing your career by letting your manager know that you have, you know, uh, mental health uh, issues, but because they want to connect in that way, they want to, you know, they share want to be real. Way. They don't want to have a real. fake persona. Exactly. They So they also want, they're expecting their leaders to also open up, to have a window into who they are. What do they think? Where do they stand in, in, in terms of things? So for example, when we have issues of uh, social justice, like, you know, we've had in the past, you know, two or three years and, and forever, right? Uh, in the past, the, you know, more senior leaders were coaching the junior leaders to say, hey, you know, John, you want to be a great leader? Hey, when there is uh, something going on in the news, in the media, there's something, you know, just kind of stay away from that, you know, uh, step back wait for the storm to pass and then you will reemerge and that's how and that worked because that's how many leaders stayed on the top was to stay you know back uh, away from all of these uh, issues because it made it allowed for them to not to have to disclose how you know what their opinions were and their positions were about certain things right so then now that that doesn't work with the new employees because the new employees now say hey if i'm going to be under your leadership i need to know who you are where, where do you stand and in terms of, you know, if there is uh, issues of social justice, right, out there, if there is disparities, racial and social disparities, what do you think? You know, so if I'm an African-American and there is something going on that is affecting the African-American and I'm being led by a leader, maybe, you know, a white leader, well, I want to understand what does that white leader think about my community, about me, you know, something unfair happened to a fellow member of my community, 
what does that leader think? I need to know because if I don't know, I don't want to be under that leadership because that's part of my psychological safety and that's part of wanting to feel more motivated to work in these companies. I need to know what kind of support I have from the leader that I am under that is you know, manifest by how they think about the community that I come from, right? So then because that's happening, the, those leaders are asking me, oh, Luis, how can, you know, I have people in my team, they they want to connect with me, they want to read, what is something that I may be able to, to you know, because I don't want to so it's just like they're protecting themselves and what i my advice to them is that it's, it's not business as usual it's a new day so you have to really change and there are some tough decisions that you're going to make because to be able to connect with those employees so they feel motivated you're going to need to make a decision to find things in your life that you never wanted to disclose then now you have to you know think about what would be something that i want to maybe you had a you know you were telling before that you were always a success you never had a failure but think about a failure of that and then you know share it with them because that's how they're going to connect with you right it has to be authentic like you were saying before all right i got a question here here's the deal you know one one issue for me is having been a therapist louise um how do i want to put this <laughs> so much that we hear so much that we're trained in or the there's supposed training does not go deep enough and I'll explain what I mean. Sure. Let me let me just say this. I was looking at 10 years ago I I taught one and New York University uh graduate okay. course on managing inclusion and cultural diversity and I swear to you I had to get a masters in my own mind to even think <laughs> I could teach a, a this 8 week course in that. But anyway, I was looking at a slide the other day, and what I saw was I had made this assumption that everybody wants to bring their whole self to work, and I said it. And there were 10 grad students, two were men or two or three, the rest were women. All the women went, oh, yeah, all the men went, what? No, I, so. I don't want to bring my whole self to work. And I was so floored, and this is why you need to really vet your teaching ideas, you know. I was like, what? You don't? What do you mean? He goes, that's the last thing I want to do. And, you know, we know why. Listen to my podcast with Mark Green. In a patriarchal world, men are in a man box culture. They it's don't be vulnerable. Don't be weak. Don't be emotional. Exactly. Things are changing, but not fast enough, if you ask me. Yeah. But so he went and he asked all of his buddies, all the men he knew and came back the next week and said, I asked 15 buddies and they all said, I do not want to bring my whole self to work. Never. So I do think we have to understand gender in relation to this, but that's not what I, my biggest point, my biggest point is this. Look at what is happening in our country. Yeah. People cannot, the vast majority of people absolutely don't know how to articulate what they feel mm -hmm. in a way that doesn't cut people down and damage relationships and destroy. Yeah. So the challenge here is bring in a therapist to help you people, but um, no, I'm being somewhat facetious. <laughs> I think the idea that we want our leaders to come forth, let's say Black Lives Matter or, uh, you know, a key issue, let's say Roe v. Wade, mm -hmm. You know, let's say a woman isn't going to feel safe with a male boss who, you know, thinks X, Y, Z. What people generally don't have any idea how to do is process their own thoughts and emotions, mm -hmm. but also pave the way to build a bridge yes. in communicating those beliefs. Yes when they are going to fly in the face of what these communities who are suffering and struggling feel. So I want to ask you and get really authentic for us. People are learning here. Let's say, I mean, I've actually talked to strangers who say, I, I was saying I'm liberal and this person was saying, well, I'm moderate. And I said, interesting. Tell me what that means. And he said, what does liberal mean? I said, it means what you probably think it means. I believe there's social injustice. I believe in, you know, Black Lives Matter. I believe in this. And, and I, when I said there's racial injustice everywhere, he said, where? I don't see it. 
Now, when you face someone who is diametrically opposed, so you're, the, you, let's say your leader says, you know, maybe he or she says, I respect your beliefs. I don't see racial injustice or social injustice or gender discrimination. Um, how do you train people yeah. that even though they don't agree, yeah. For to emotional intelligence to to exist, we have to understand that the impact of our views, yeah. and and we have to learn how to build a bridge to people who do not view life the way we do. Would you agree with that statement? Uh, absolutely. You bring up a fantastic point. In fact, you know, one of my motivations that I had to come into this work was that I learned many years ago that people had a limited understanding of of empathy, right? So because there's a there's a big opportunity with emotional intelligence in multiple components, self-awareness and empathy. Uh, but one of the things I learned was that people think, many people think of empathy uh, only about one of its components that has to do, you know, with the emotions, with, you know, kind of uh, accompanying someone in feeling something that someone else uh, is feeling, even when that, you know, may not reflect your own situation. That is, in fact, empathy. When somebody says, you know, it's like, hey, you had a, a loved one uh, that you lost a loved one and, you know, the, the person is is, is sad. And then you can say, hey, you know, I offer you my condolences that they think of that as empathy, which is correct. That is one component of empathy. What people don't always realize that that is not all that empathy is in a very important component of empathy. It has to do with the cognitive, right, which is about more about the thinking. So it's, uh, empathy gives us the opportunity to actually uh, spend the time, you know, commit to spend the time to think through somebody else's thinking and logic and try to understand why somebody thinks, you know, try to understand the way somebody else thinks, even when it doesn't match yours, and try to understand why they think in the way that they think so that you can connect with them. And actually, this is very fascinating because when I'm training these, people tell me, well, but, you know, that would be agreeing. And I say, no, 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 that's not agreeing. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a difference between understanding and agreeing. And when you, you know, when you understand something, you don't necessarily agree with it. And people say, no, that's that, that's not true. How can you, you know, uh, Come on. It, they not agree with it? It means, it, can I just say this? In therapy training, we learned every behavior makes sense when you understand the context in which exactly. it developed. So exactly. you understand that, you know, I'm a woman, you're a man, you're a Latino man, I'm Greek and Italian. <laughs> I can understand that your journey has led you in a very different direction. Yes. And the, the reason why that is super powerful is because going back again to my point on connection, right? So, you know, um, when, when people tell me, I don't understand how you can uh, understand something without agreeing it. I say, well, one of the examples is I've had the opportunity to work with uh, law enforcement, uh, multiple, you know, law enforcement agencies. And so those that work, you know, when somebody's kidnapped, right, and they're they're talking to the, the you know, the bad guy, because it's usually a guy, that's these kind of things, right? And they, they need to establish a connection with the person to negotiate. Usually what they do, there, there are two important components there. One is they work in teams. So let's say, you know, somebody's held, uh, you know, is being kidnapped. I establish a communication with the with the person and i have a whole team that is working for me and they are live the moment that i'm talking to a person they're investigating who is that person where did that person where was the person born where did the person grow up who were their parents who are their siblings who you know any relatives working with them where do they live where do they go to school what kind of religion do they have they're trying to understand everything that they can about the person as quickly as possible to try to form that profile of who is that person and what might they have in their head and the reason why they do that is to try to understand the logic of why the person could be thinking in the way that they're thinking that may have led them to do this terrible thing that they're doing and so by doing that they can incorporate that into the language and say hey you know um, i can match yeah, we learned I, in therapy if i match language or you know yes, he mirror, swears right? i'm gonna swear ah there's an unconscious belief that you're similar that you get me absolutely so you mirror you connect with the person but that doesn't mean that the law enforcement agent uh you know would do something like that they would never do it but they use language to say I understand, you know, uh, that you're doing this. Uh, I can see why, right? And that's like very strategic language to say, 
I am following you in how you're thinking, but I don't, you know, I wouldn't do that myself, right? And that's very important to understand. So, for example, when, you know, our country is going through such a terrible political uh, crisis where people are, you know, families are, you know, obviously breaking apart because they can agree, you know, uh, on political uh, terms. So then it's like if you meet somebody that is diametrically like in the complete opposite, you know, thinking of you, his emotional intelligence will give you the ability, you have to train for this where you can genuinely you know put your thoughts on pause for a second and you know you kind of open a drawer put your thoughts there close the drawer and then you actively listen to the person and as you hear the person without any judgment you try to uh, use your own intelligence to actually follow the logic of what the person is saying to try to understand the thinking process that is making that person think that and by interestingly enough in many cases I mean, one is is going to help uh, your understanding of the world because, you know, you're going to get a perspective that is different than yours. So now you're smarter and wiser because you have a new perspective you didn't have before. But it, there are instances where it can actually change your mind. It has happened to me that uh, somebody has said something. I was like, wow, that's totally the opposite of what I believe. And then I say, okay, let's use my emotional intelligence here. And then I, you know, listen attentively and I test, you know, what the person is saying. And then I, you know, I check it with other things, testing a lot. And then I say, I'm going to need to change my mind here because what I was thinking it's no longer true. In fact, then my last point, because I know I've extended uh -huh. it a lot, but I just wanted to add, there is a colleague that I work with. Um, she is uh, French and, and lives in uh, Scotland. And part of her work is she works with authors that need to rewrite the book because in the new edition, they need to change about something that they said in, in a previous edition of a book that was true for them at the moment that they wrote it, that is no longer true. So in a new edition, they change basically the, you know, a notion or something that is fascinating, right? Wow. I love it. You know, again, talking about therapeutic training, I, I think this relates and I want to offer it as a tip. Um, when I was an intern at 41, I, I had uh, clients that were d difficult for me, a, a client who beat his daughter. And I my first session with this guy, I'm like, and he was mandated to come. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't, I'm not trained to do this. What do I do? And he's beating his daughter. And I went, I got through the first session, went to my supervisor and she said, let me give you a tip here. If you sit in judgment of this person, mm -hmm. you will not help them. Yeah. You must find something to love, which is not exactly what you're saying. And I'm like, what? I got to find something to love? She said, yes, because otherwise here is this individual. Yes, he's mandated, but he's sitting there with you trying to get some help or understanding. And if you are judging mm -hmm. in your heart, you have lost it. And I'm yeah. like, oh my God, I got to find something to love. So the next week I committed to find something to love. And I did. And because of that, I'm not saying I was the best therapist in the world, but I said to him, what, what not why, because that puts people on defensive, what leads you to hit her? And he said, she doesn't respect me. Wow. And it's the only way I can have yeah. her respect me. And so because he trusted me, we got to the point of hitting her is not building trust, uh, respect. It's hurting her. It's damaging her. It's making her afraid. You're, you're pushing away the very thing. But none of that could have happened unless I could say, I've got, this is a human being sitting in front of me yeah. doing horrible things, but I have to find something to love. Does that fit any kind of any paradigm you have or you yeah, yeah yeah no absolutely thank you for the story because one of the things also with emotional intelligence is that the concept of timing is that there are we by default are ready to jump in and do some things and one of those is judgment right so we by default when somebody says something to us like i always say in my training we need to open our minds to the notion that the way we see things may not be the way things actually are. So then you include a component of timing is when something, when you have a stimuli, when you see something and your brain goes to like decode and decide. You're so wrong and, uh, you know, ah, yeah, right. you immediately stop and say, okay, let me see what other information I can get, you know, so that I can then finally make the judgment. So I want to share a story uh, with you. So in, in one university 
uh, a professor, uh, so a group of students have to do a group assignment and they go to the professor and say, hey, <clears throat> you know, here we did the, the group assignment, but there is this one student that didn't contribute to the to the group. So, you know, we don't want, you know, obviously that person shouldn't get the grade because that person didn't work, right? When you get that information, what's the first thing that you're going to think, you know, it's like, yeah, that person yeah, is that that person a deadbeat. Help. Person freeloader. Out, we're gonna get the yeah freeloader. You know, it's gonna it's not gonna get the great. And let's see how we can penalize this person and all that. But if you use emotional intelligence, you use that information and say, okay, thank you. That's an input that I have. What's next? I need to talk with the person, right? And see kind of what is their their view of this. And then when you meet with the person, the person says, hey. For the past three months, I've been trying to connect with this group. I've been reaching out to them. I've sent them email here. Look, I'm going to forward to you all the emails that I have sent to them. When I met with them, I gave them these ideas. They didn't take any of my ideas. And it's like, look at all of the things that I did to try to be part of a group. And none of them were welcome. And I was basically shut down, right? So then if you take all of that information and it's real, it's sincere, and you have enough evidence, then here you're in a situation where it's not that this person was a freeloader, lazy person, didn't want to help. What you have is a team that was not open to that person being part of it, the team and as a result you know the person couldn't contribute now if you take it so that they actually this is a real story and the university gave the grade to that student that didn't contribute because he had all you know he did everything that he could to contribute and if you apply that to the workplace it's like if you as a leader if you have a member of your team if you have somebody in the company that is not having good performance that's one input the person is having low performance but the the uh, or poor performance but the, the second part is okay what other information can i gather okay how is that you know if we hire that person something good we must have seen in that person that person has to have a talent but why is the performance being uh, poor or low well how is that person you know welcoming the team how is that person incorporated are their ideas being you know uh follow or people you know how is that person receiving are they an introvert and moment? they contribute and speak differently or think right. differently so then in some cases, though, in, in many cases, it's women and people of color that end up, you know, uh, if they don't they don't feel welcome, they don't have the right support, and then they don't perform well, then they are of a company. And then, you know, the other day, somebody was uh, citing a um, like statistic with me saying, hey, you know, people of color have the fastest uh, rate in terms of like starting new companies. So it's like, yeah, celebration on one end, fantastic. Uh, people of color and women starting new companies. But think about why are they starting new companies? Right. One of the reasons is they go into corporate, they are trying trying to, you know, use their talents to advance and contribute. And when they run into these walls, they say, I can't make it here. I'm going to have to do my own thing. And when they go and do their own thing, they are very successful. Well, what is that telling you? Somebody that was able to be, have their own business and be very successful was not able to be successful within the co context of a corporation. We need to study the, the, the environment, what is happening in the system, in the structure that is not allowing a successful, that a person that will otherwise be successful to be successful in this environment. Oh, please, I love it. I want to amplify one thing, then I've got to ask, where can we learn all about you and get your trainings? But if you need a, a, a way to remember what Luis is saying, when I um, was a marriage and family therapist, it's exactly what you said. The wife or the husband would come in and they would say, here's what's happening. <laughs> and I'd, I'd go as an intern, go right down the rabbit hole. Oh, wow, that's bad. They're doing blah, blah, blah. Then you bring the other one in. Right. It. It's a completely different story. Yeah. And, and that's why family therapists do family work because the picture is skewed if you're only yeah. listening to one. And so if you ever wonder, is that true? Think about your own relationships. Right. If, if you went and told someone what was happening, is it really the whole picture? No. Yeah. So that is just such a powerful story. I love it. All right, Luis, we could talk forever, but where do we... Where do we read all your work? Where do we get your trainings? Where do we send people to learn more? Of course. I mean, you know, multiple social media platforms, but I think, you know, LinkedIn, LinkedIn, Instagram, and YouTube. So on LinkedIn, Luis Moreno in, uh, in Minnesota, uh, Emotional Intelligence uh, on YouTube. Also Luis Moreno. I use the initials T C B P N. So T as in Tom, C as in Charlie, B as in Boy, P as in Peter, N as in Nancy. And we'll Twin have those cities. links below, people. Business but peer what does network. that stand for? Uh, so Twin people. Cities Business Peer Network is an organization that I uh, I'm part of and I helped uh, to fund. So 
And uh, on YouTube, I have put uh, clips of multiple sessions so people can go in uh, and listen. I want to I wanna share just one quick uh, uh, story that uh, you know how like connected to your story on family therapy is that empathy actually has a, a, a great, you know, empathy can help us in many ways, obviously in the workplace, because it can help us understand how other people think, feel, and their experiences. Uh, and one of the things that I hear the most, I'm not a therapist and I don't work uh, with couples, but as, uh, th these sessions, these training sessions end up being like therapies as people open their hearts and tell me stories. But what I find is, you know, I'm at that age that m many, most of my friends have unfortunately uh, divorced. And a lot of times the story is that they kind of grew apart right they had like a different interest and one of the things that i say with emotional intelligence is that it helps you to understand that there are things intrinsically that you're going to be naturally interested in because those things are you know just kind of like you you maybe you watch sport and that's something that you just like naturally but one of the things uh is that when you are with someone you know a significant uh, other one I'm going to talk about the, the personal component, but we can apply for, to the workplace is that if I am with someone and I love that person, if that person is important to me, one of the things that empathy can help me with is to say, okay, because I am with this person and this person is important in my life and I would like to continue to have the company of that person for many years of in my life, if we only pay attention to our own interests and the things that we're naturally you know attracted to then naturally we're going to end up going in different directions so i can use emotional intelligence to basically direct myself to put the time and the attention with willingness to say okay so uh kathy let's say you know if you if you and i were a couple of say okay kathy likes to um you know she likes opera for example making this up but she likes yeah, opera, i do love opera. i don't <laughs> But because I, you know, Kathy is important to me, I need to actually, and some people would think, well, that's disingenuous because you're forcing yourself, but it's not. I mean, it's just to say, okay, let me talk to Kathy so that she tells me more about what is it about opera that, you know, that she likes, what is it that she enjoys and all that. And in fact, uh, I can start, you know, to learn more about it, to start to like it progressively, little by little. But ultimately what I have to think is, okay, the more that I get, uh, you know, if I get closer to that thing that you know my uh, partner likes and enjoys and loves and I and I'm more interested in and I you know express a sincere you know interest and engagement in it and I learn more about it uh you're going to appreciate that you're going to see it as a you know as an expression of love as a gift uh to you it'll help us uh connect better but like I was saying earlier it could happen that I end up uh realizing that there is something that I never thought would like that starts to that I start to like, especially because the most if I love someone, the most important thing for me has to be to see that person happy. And if me coming closer into that topic area or you know whatever they like makes them happier, that in itself has to be a motivation for me to want to be closer uh, to that. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. And how would you relate that to the workplace? Yes, because sometimes we have, uh, in, so let's say that I have an employee in my team that comes to me and says, wow, you know, Luis, I need to leave on Friday a little earlier because it's the World Cup, uh, you know, the soccer World Cup, you know, Argentina is going to play, you know, France. And I'm like, it's like, sorry, but like, you know, I like food. I like, uh, and, you know, NFL, American football. I don't like soccer. So I don't, I can't relate. And it's like, why well, no, I'm sorry. You can't, you know, on Friday, we have this assignment and this and that. We have a client, you know, you have to stay. You cannot go. Because in this case, you know, I'm not being able, I'm, I'm just kind of focusing on the things that are important to me in this case, you know, like American football. And I am not being able to put my world aside for a moment to connect with this person, understand, okay, something that means nothing to me means the world to somebody else. And for that employee to make the to give the most of themselves, to give the most productive and the, the best work, they have to love the work they do and to love the work they do. They have to feel good, you know, with themselves. They have to do the things that they enjoy. So then I will, uh, you know, again, I'm using force myself. It's probably the, the wrong word, but I am going to take the, myself, self-motivation to direct myself to get interested in something that means something to somebody else and say, wow, and I could, and I could actually, you in, in that journey, in that vector, I could say, what time is the game? Do you want to watch it here in the office? Let's call the, the rest of it. Holy cow. Yeah. That Let's would be some boss. Together. Let's watch I love it. Together. My son, yeah. they, they were watching it. They had the screens on. And yeah. I would say, you know, I always hear, and then we'll end people because I know you have other things going on. 
I always hear objections in my mind of what my listeners are thinking. So I'm going to throw this out to you, Luis, and then we'll end. I think that sometimes um, going over that bridge into I end up loving what that person loved, let's say soccer, which is, of course, an international sport. And here in America, we're way behind about it. I think what you could do is find something to love, one thread of it or love that that person loves it. We're not asking you to now adopt everybody's interests and, and you're not, you're, you, you know, you're a different person. We are asking you to find something to love. And I am going to say love, you know, I, I often say, you can say anything if you say it with love in your heart and people will say, love my, my corporate <laughs> environment doesn't have any love. Well, it's time that we have love. And I don't mean it, you know, romantically, I mean, love in your heart, which yeah. is respect care, appreciation, empathy, compassion, try to make a bridge to the people that you're living and working with and spending more time at work than mostly anybody in your life. Would, would that summarize it well? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, definitely makes sense. And I would say that just like in, you know, if we talk about like a personal, in, in the personal uh, sense of things, if someone that is, if someone supposedly uh, loves you, but the person cannot find it in themselves to appreciate something that is the most important thing for me, if I am a, an actor and I am into theater and that's the most important thing for me and you cannot even yeah. find it in your heart to take a day an entrance, uh, an to interest. come see me or anything like that, I could think that maybe you may not really love me as much as you're thinking in the same way. I would say if I have a leader, if I am being led by a leader that I talk to and I tell him about something that is really important to me that I have a passion for that is, you know, so important in my life and that leader cannot even ask me questions about it and cannot find it in themselves to develop a little bit of interest in that, I could make the connection to say, that great leader may not be that great leader for me. That may not be the great leader that I need to be under because if they are not uh, interested in the idea that I be happy and successful, they may not put the time and the effort to provide the, the opportunities and the development and the resources for me so that I can succeed in my journey. Thank you for the invitation, Kathy. It's always, always a pleasure to be and talk with you. Uh, no, Luis, I loved it. I learned so much. All right, people. I hope you're inspired. I hope that we've given specific tips. We're not asking you to turn yourself inside out. And Luis and I are doing this work right along with you. There's yeah. amazing millions of opportunities to grow in this way, but you're probably going to have questions like the questions you brought up that people have, like, do I really have to do this? <laughs> <laughs> so wherever you see this on LinkedIn, I know Luis, you're very active there. So am I. Will you ask us a question? I feel like we're not doing our jobs. If if this hasn't spurred some kind of question or challenge, we would love to hear from you. We would love to support you in any way in being a great leader and continuing to grow in that way because that's what today's times require. So we hope you loved it. We'd love to hear from you and have a wonderful week. And Louise, come back, will you, for part Thank three, you, yeah. four, and five. <laughs> would love to. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Thank you, everyone. Have a great few weeks. Bye. Hi, folks. Kathy here. I'm thrilled to share that I'm offering a new session of my eight-week coaching and training course, The Most Powerful You, starting May 10th. In eight powerhouse weeks together, I'll train all about the content of my book, The Most Powerful You, helping professional women address what I've seen are the seven most damaging power and confidence gaps that block women from achieving their most exciting goals and their happiest and highest potential and success. This includes imposter syndrome that impacts 75% of executive women today. The course offers eight weekly Zoom coaching calls with me, eight video training modules, a step-by-step -step process for boosting your career in confidence, fantastic additional resources from over 30 of the nation's top experts, a private online support community for members, and more. Spots are very limited, so sign up now at mostpowerfulyou.com. And when you register as an early bird, you'll save $300 and get eight amazing bonuses. I've delivered aspects of this training to over 50 organizations worldwide, and participants have called it transformative and life-changing. I'm confident this course will move you forward fast. I hope to see you there. 
Thanks so much for joining us today. And please don't forget to check out FindingBrave.org for more programs, resources, and tips. And tune in next time for your weekly dose of Finding Brave.